everyone. Gosh, it's great to be here again in Miami with everyone. I uh, have to confess, I begin to look forward to this event about six months out, right? And we start planning on who we want to meet with and the folks we want to see again, and of course, the, the good times that we want to have together as a community. So I appreciate the time this afternoon. I'm going to be speaking with you today about using incident command system for industrial control systems, hence ICS for ICS. So um, I, this journey really started for me um, back in 2007 timeframe. I had a really good internship in the Governor's Office of Commonwealth Preparedness in Virginia. And from there, I was lucky enough to be hired after my internship where I started out in the Interoperability Coordination Office and then gradually moved up to where I was eventually running the state's Critical Infrastructure Protection Program. So, I love SIP, it'll always kind of be my, my first love in terms of my career, and I really view the work that I'm doing now at Rockwell Automation as a continuation um, in support of, of critical infrastructure protection as a whole, right? I view ICS protection as an extension of that. Um, I've also worked for, for GE, I was the head of the GE product security incident response team as well as the product security leader for GE Global Research. So that was an awesome opportunity. And again, the skills that I picked up at GE really honed in in the ICS space, um, kind of taking it a few notches down from the, uh, the more enterprise level view of SIP that I had when I worked in the governor's office. But again, tremendous experience. And so what I'm going to be talking uh, to you all today is about the experience that I've had in utilizing Incident Command System, which is a part of the National Incident Management System, to successfully facilitate and coordinate uh, responses to hurricanes, to fires, to floods, uh, pretty much any type of natural disaster you can imagine. But I also believe that within this community, we can take this approach and adapt it to use in coordination for community responses uh, to um, to industrial control systems incidents. So I, I love this quote. I think it's a timeless quote. Those who love peace must learn to organize as effectively as those who love war. Um, this is really a, a call to action within the community saying that there's probably a better way that we could be organizing our responses. And so with that, how many folks in the audience have ever toured a state or local emergency operations center, or also known as a multi-agency coordination center, a MAC? Okay? So if you haven't had that opportunity, I'd say definitely reach out to your local emergency manager. If you don't know who that is, I suggest after this presentation looking up who that person may be in your locality and what that process looks like within your state, right? Because if you come from an emergency management background, uh, the old adage is all emergencies are local, right? They all start local, they all end local, and the resources that are brought to bear to respond to them are also local resources, right? So from this picture here, this is actually uh, taken directly from the Virginia Emergency Operations Center. You can tell that this picture looks pretty chaotic, right? It's a lot of folks running around. Folks are obviously very focused on the work that's in front of them, and they're executing, right? In reality, this runs like an orchestra. Everything is very well coordinated. Everyone has a role, and everyone understands the role that they're playing. Um, and so it's, it's a good structure to decompose very large and complex problems and begin to assign responsibilities for those that can work on them. So what does cyber incident response coordination look like today? If you've uh, ever had the experience, the opportunity to be on conference calls when initial notification of an event comes in, uh, you can appreciate that it's normally a lot, of call, a lot of people on a conference call coming together to develop a plan on how they want to assign priority to the incident as well as resources that they will in turn bring to bear to respond to the incident. But in large, my experience has been it's a lot of people on a conference call, it's one person running the call, they're asking for input from other people on the call, right? So SOC director, what's the update on patching? All right, that's done. 
Uh, what are we doing over here in Threat Intel? What's the latest? It's one person generally facilitating a large amount of data. And coincidentally, I have seen, and you may have seen it as well, that this person in many cases is also taking notes on the call. Or maybe they've assigned one other person to take notes on the call, and following the call, you'll all kind of get this email that says, all right, this is what the plan is. This is the t these are the teams that are operating. And this is generally when we expect things to be done. And these emails are sent up to leadership. Your executives are briefed. Um, you're still coordinating things um, at a more tactical level. So lots of, lots of energy, lots of things going on. But, but with that, again, it's not organized in a framework that in many cases is repeatable outside of your organization. And so it isn't that the playbooks, right? I hear that term, playbooks. The playbooks that we have in place now, it's not that they're wrong. It's that they're, they're just somewhat incomplete. And so if we move to a framework which has already been adopted by the federal, state, and local first responders in, in government, right? If we move to that framework, we're naturally going to be aligned to be able to better support one another in future events that involve cyber. So I think that most people in this room, if you're at this conference, you believe that there will be an increase in times where we're going to need to see coordination between the government and the private sector, right? So. Question to you all, open question. Do we think that we can do this better? Do we think that the operating structure that we have in place today, with most companies, public, private, you name it, having their own response plans, do we think that that is serving us? And do we think that it's going to continue to serve us in the future? So this is a slide I'm going to spend a lot of time on because in the time that I have with you, I'm going to walk you through what the incident command system is. So at the top here, this is the most significant position. This is an incident commander. This is the person that is in charge of the entire incident. So they are accountable for what I call the resources, people, money, and stuff that is required to coordinate a response. And so the buck stops with them in terms of who has authority over the incident. How many of you all have response plans that don't have an authority section within the document? So that authority section is very important. And I have seen successfully where people have put this in at the very front of the document saying, generally, this is what we plan to do. This is what this plan is outlining. And these are the individuals or the entity that has given me legal authority to conduct the response, right? So that I see, that's the person that has the authority to call the shots. And typically, incident commanders um, may not be who, who you may imagine. In many cases, yes, it is the state coordinator of emergency management or the local emergency manager or whomever when you're talking about the, um, the public sector side. But in reality, when we go through incident command training with the government, an IC could be any one of us. Um, I've seen cases where um, people have come up on a car accident, right, and say it's an off-duty firefighter that happens to you know, be driving along the road, see an accident, they get out, they check everyone out, make sure everyone's OK, and call it in, right? That person is the IC for that incident until someone else arrives on scene and assumes that duty. And so you can be, you know, kind of an entry level person, but if you're the first one to be notified of something, you are the IC until you successfully pass that responsibility off to, uh, to whomever is gonna take it on in the next step, right? Secondly, uh, legal. So legal and public information, communications, and officers. I can't stress this part enough. You cannot have a successful response unless your legal counsel is hooked in to advise you, as well as your public information officer so that your communications are synced, uh, they're being kept up to date, they know what's going on, and they're able to effectively communicate that to an external audience. The next line here, this is really where the work happens. So the first one is operations section. The ops section is run by an individual that is termed the operations section chief. And that individual is responsible for 
tasking out um, duties and functions that have to get done to successfully respond to the incident. And beneath that, you see I, I have a box here that says strike team. That's just an example of resources and functions that can be placed under the ops section. You can also have task force. So kind of an, an easy, simple way to explain the difference between a strike team and a task force is, um, say we had a tree down in the middle of a road, right? A local emergency manager is like, well, we obviously have to remove this tree. They could technically call in a chainsaw strike team, which could cut the tree up but they may be better served if they requested a tree removal task force, which would have not only the strike team, but other resources like trucks required to haul away the debris. So that's just a simple example. Don't get too stuck on that, but as I'm going through this, try to, um, try to make the logical leap of applying some of these applications for, for our space. So an example may be, um, a malware reverse engineer strike team could be called in to support an incident, right? I'm going to talk a little bit more, but that gets into the importance of typing resources, right, and actually knowing the resources that are available to us. Moving on, we have the planning section. So I've, I've always loved when I've been asked to support the planning section and the planning section chief, again, the section chief uh, title there, and that they are the folks that when you're standing up your incident coordination call, they are going to be meticulously documenting who was on the call, what functions they represent. They're going to be documenting the updates that are provided from the various response teams or emergency support functions. And then they're going to develop a very important document that guides how you respond. And that's called an incident action plan, an IEP. And you can expect IEPs to be updated every six to eight hours or operational period. And what an IAP outlines is, again, this is management by objective from the incident commander from that lead position. They're going to tell you within the next six to eight to 12 hours, I would like these four things to be accomplished. In order for this response to be successful, these things have to be completed. And so the planning section will document that for you, and they will decompose those large goals into tasks that have to be performed by each of the response teams. And they will continually get updates from you as you're helping to respond. So I love working with planning sections. It really is the heart of the response, and it's what fuels successful responses, right? I think today, going back to, well, what does it look like in cyber incident response, we still have a combination of the same person is the incident commander, the ops section chief, and the planning section chief, right? So it's a big job, and I, I think that we can, we can do better by designating um, solid individuals to perform each of these tasks, because as you all know, it's more than enough work to go around. The third section here is logistics section. These are the folks that are doing a lot in the background to support the success of the incident. So if there's a particular software you need, if there's a particular product you need, if you need food, these people get you what you need so that you can focus on the response. And lastly, this is an area um, that's often uh, underscored or underplayed during responses, but it's very vital. And that is the tracking of time and personnel so that you can accurately account for what did this response cost us, right? And so this is a, a very abbreviated version of incident command system, but I, I think that it's a successful way that we can, uh, we can organize to respond together, right? And when you're using a common framework like this, it allows other organizations to easily plug and play. I've seen cases where um, one state has requested an additional planning section chief that was sent from New York or California. All of these requests for resources are coordinated through that logistics section. And what happens is that, um, say, a, a particular response team was working an issue and they realized that they just didn't have enough engineers to respond to something. They could submit a request through the logistics section and put out a call, if you will, for mutual aid support 
um, to other states. And that request is honored through a system called EMAC. It's the Emergency Management Assistance Compact, where even if we're operating without a presidential declaration, that EMAC construct is still in place to enable states to share resources. And I think that something similar could be done in our community under the right setup. So what does ICS give you? I've touched on this a little bit, but the first thing is it's a common framework for organizing responses, right? It's your response plan looks pretty similar to my response plan because they have common templates and they have common sections that they're addressing or speaking to. There's also common roles within that. The second item is repeatable action plans and documentation. Folks, this saves you so much time during a response. I know the last thing I want to be doing when I'm running a response is taking notes, right? I don't want to be formatting a document or you know, messing with things like that. I want to have a template that I can break out that already has the main headers and sections that I need to fill in, and it's just boom, 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 right? It's so much faster, and it's very beneficial in that it kind of trains people that are reviewing the documents to know where to look for particular things, so you're not searching all around for information, especially when you're running a stressful response, right? Sharing of resources. This goes back to the typing issue. Again, I don't know if, if you all lay awake at night thinking about this, but I do sometimes. How many cyber response resources do we have across the nation, across the world, to respond to incidents that come up? I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that we don't have enough, right? I don't know that we will ever have enough. So with that, we need to be able to get our arms around what the capability sets are for individuals, who has what skill set, and is there a way to type it? Meaning if we were to look at any one of us in the audience and the training that all of us have gone through, would there be a way to say, you know, Ben over here, I'm going to certify him as a type 2 incident coordinator because he's run over 30 incidents and he's had the following training? Or again, the malware, uh, the malware engineer um, example. This person could be a type one, meaning, hey, you know, they, they got out of college, they've been working for two or three years, so they may be more at an entry level. But what I'm suggesting is that there's a way that we can organize this information so that it's working better for us, it's working better for our companies, for our customers, and, and really in support of any type of disaster that could come up, we would have that information available. And again, it makes it easier for sharing the resources as well, because if I know that teams exist in an organization that I have legal agreements with for mutual aid, I can request those resources. And in turn, um, when they're in a bind, I may be willing to share resources that I have at my disposal to support them. It's really neat in that I heard recently that the electric sector, which has been sharing um, linemen and, and crews uh, across companies for years now to respond to power outages and hurricanes and everything that they have to deal with. They've been sharing resources on that level for countless years now, and they're now doing it for cyber because they get it and they know that this can work successfully. And lastly, again, the point that I made on the previous slide, which is understanding your cost and resource tracking. I, again, have seen many times where there is behavior that is allowed on the cyber incident response side that would never be allowed in typical responses run out of the emergency management community, like people working for 24 hours straight. That would never be allowed in the emergency management community. We recognize response fatigue, we respect it, and we pull in extra people to support the response because we plan for and anticipate surge capacity. We don't anticipate or plan for surge capacity in this community at all. At all. Our plan for that is kind of a countless number of caffeinated drinks to keep people awake to run the duration of the response. OK, so just really quickly, I'm going to go through three use cases to show you how we could do this. So the first one is the most basic. It's just common language. It's all the things that I've been talking about in the previous slides that we need a common language. If I'm referring to you know, Ben or Sally, that's not helpful in the context in that I can only utilize the individual for the response to the extent that I understand their resume and their capabilities. 
which mostly is revolving off of trust and word of mouth at this point, right? It's tribal knowledge. It's not really documented or categorized in a user-friendly way. If we type individuals and their skill sets, we can better utilize them for responses. Use case number two, mutual aid. So this is, the, again, the example where I am not going through an emergency right now. So if my partner company or um, some other entity that I have a relationship with, if they are in need of resources that I have and we have legal agreements in place to share those resources, I can offer up those resources when they request them to help support their incident. Use case number three. This is the one that uh, when Dale Peterson and I were talking about this concept and me coming on stage today and speaking to you all, this was really kind of what focused around that conversation was gray swan events, right? These are events of uh, watershed proportion where the community will be called to action to respond not only um, from a private sector perspective, but we're going to need the government's help and they're going to need our help as well. And so this use case, again, ensures that the government, um, Mark Bristow or someone, could pick up my response plan and say, all right, yep, I see her resources are typed here, I understand her plan, I understand her notifications for procedure, and I understand her, her, uh, her procedures all, all the way through running the incident to the recovery end, right? It just means that we can all be singing off of the same sheet of music. And so I think that we have a tremendous opportunity ahead of us to, to plan and actually get this done. And again, I'm not telling anyone throw away your current response plan. I know that's not going to work. It's not going to fly. I think that most of the elements that are currently within the playbooks or response plans that we have in our community, I think that they can be adapted. We just need to put it in a template that can be shared across, uh, across the private sector that's in alignment with incident command system and NEMS. So, this is where I'm going to present some information to try to make this really easy for you all because I want you to say yes. I want you to go back home and I want you to look at your response plans and I want you to kind of call deep on your courage and say, I'm going to visit the FEMA website and check this material out and see if it might be able to work. So let our advanced worrying and advanced thinking and planning, ugh, I'm sorry, I messed that up. Let our advanced worrying become advanced thinking and planning. So, five tips to get you started. The first thing is identify your top hazards and risk. Secondly, begin to type your resources and personnel. Develop plans using a consistent format. Templating is everything. Make this easier for yourselves. Utilize incident action plans. This is something that I bet you could pretty instantly put in place once you download templates for what an IEP looks like, and I'm hoping that you'll like it and you'll want to use it, but you can absolutely take action on that quickly. And lastly, train, then exercise. I can't tell you the number of times I have seen very complex, very detailed, you know, 60-page response plans written in organizations, and then folks are like, all right, we got a plan. Well, uh, we're going to do a tabletop exercise, like, in two months. You can't do that. You actually have to train people on what you say you're going to do in your plan. But many people don't use tabletop exercises to exercise their plan to see if it works. They use tabletop exercises as a form of facilitated discussion to educate their executives as well as to basically train on their plan, which is not bad. I'm not suggesting that you can't do that or you shouldn't. I'm just kind of calling it like it is that there's a lack of training that accompanies many of these response plans. So do yourself a favor and uh, develop training programs to support your plans versus just jumping straight into exercising them. Okay, so characteristics of a healthy IR culture. This slide is just really about kind of last minute things I wanted you all to be able to take home and consider as part of this. So the first thing that, that I've noticed, in healthy IR cultures, it's understood who's in charge of the incident. In many cases, again, the response starts churning and 
It's not clear to anyone which executive, if it isn't an executive, or if it's a SOC director or whomever, who actually has authority over the incident. At the end of the day, who is accountable for the response? That needs to be clearly understood. The next thing is everyone has a distinct role and everyone is allowed to play that role. I think that's just good advice for any organization that you work in. Um, I can tell you that someone that I used to work with when I first came in, into an organization, I said, hey, you got any tips for me? They said, sure. You'll be successful in this company as long as you understand that everyone has a role and you allow them to play that role and everyone's role is respected. And so the, the person that said that to me, I'll, I'll be forever thankful because I just think that that's really good sage advice and it absolutely applies in this situation as well. The next one, there's a clear separation in responsibilities of the planning and operations sections. Again, this goes back to the people that are hands-on keyboard responding to a cyber incident should not also be the same people that are responsible for documenting what's being sent out in an email or an action plan or anything like that. They need to be able to focus on the response. Next, again, I mentioned this earlier, legal and communications are a part of the response. Next, you have communications appendices to your response plan that are aligned to unique hazards and threats. So ideally, what a response plan would look like is that you have a basic plan which outlines roles and responsibilities that are really going to be applicable to any incident. And then you have appendices or annexes that are specific to threats. Remember where the part where I said map out your threats? This is where you would document that. So you would have a basic plan that, excuse me, then you would have an annex, say, for malware or malware response or ransomware. And that tells you how your organization is going to respond to that threat. But it builds off of the basic plan, so it's modular. It's not like you have to go back in an 80-page document and say, well, shoot, a new threat has come up, so I've got to write this paragraph in there right now. Don't do stuff like that. Just build an annex that's separate for it so that your plans are always modular and they can always be updated and adapted without going out of style or, or not being current, right? And with that, the communications piece is where you have that public information officer and hopefully your legal counsel helping you to write some good messages to where, hey, if your company just got hacked, I'm pretty sure that you want to have a statement to release externally, like in your back pocket. That's where you have that and that's where you keep it is it's part of that response plan and the communication support annex. Uh, next to last, operational periods are consistent and understood. Again, it's the eight to 12 hour rule. Um, incidents that I've run, I remember working out at EOCs and doing the 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift, right? And then the 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. shift. So everyone understands the operational periods. No one's working two operational periods straight. And this also helps in that, um, again, back to that public information officer role, if you need to make a statement to the press, guess what the best times for doing that are? Right before noon, because that's when the lunchtime media comes on, and then right before 6 o'clock, because that's when their next press period is going to be coming. So you're prepared for those as well. And lastly, on-call versus not on-call policies. I'm sure that there are quite a number of folks in this room that have been off enjoying a vacation somewhere, maybe they've been on a cruise ship, maybe they haven't had any cell connectivity for their phone to sync back up and see like 15 missed calls from whomever that an incident is occurring and you need to be able to respond. So it needs to be clear if you're um, not working during the normal nine to five, Monday through Friday, whatever, that if you are on call, you know that you're on call and folks that are not on call can go off and enjoy their vacation and you know, not have to worry about incidents popping up. That's just fairness and equity within response because all of us cannot be on call all the time. You're setting yourself up for failure that way, but um, that's it. And here's where you can find all these training materials. So again, dig deep, get some courage, go out and investigate this, and let's see if we can make it work as a community because I know it can work for individual companies. I know that it works in mutual aid. I know that it works on the public sector very well. And if this community can pull this off, I think that this can save lives. So thank you so much for your time.